are Latino, we are Native American, we are Democrat, we are Republican, we are independent, we are people of faith, we are people not of faith, we are natives and immigrants, we are business leaders and workers and unemployed, we are doctors and the uninsured, we are gay, we are straight, we are students, we are parents, we are retirees. We are North Carolina and we are here and we ain't going nowhere. Well, I know we have some men in the audience, <laughs> but we are we, we are women. <laughs> but I do want to thank the men for coming out this morning and uh, and attending this session also. So right now I'm going to introduce our um, speaker for the hour. Judith Diane Brown Dianas co-director advancement project. She has an extensive background in civil rights litigation and advocacy in the areas of voting, education, housing, and employment. She has protected the rights of people of color in the midst of some of the greatest civil rights crises of our modern time, including in Florida about 2000, after the 2000 election and the New Orleans after the Hurricane Katrina. Under Diana's leadership, Advancement Project has been dismantling the school to prison pipeline in school districts throughout the country since 1999. Diana has authored ground, groundbreaking reports on the issues including opportunity to suspend in 2000 and derail the schoolhouse to, to jailhouse track indicate the schoolhouse to jailhouse track. Uh, detailing the unnecessary civilization of students by their schools. Working closely with grassroots organization, Advancement Projects Works has significantly decreased student suspension and arrest in, in Denver, Baltimore, and Florida. Additionally, Advancement Project has worked to build and support a growing national movement on the issue. Dinah's accomplishment to racial equality in public schools carries over her position on the Board of Fair Test, and she is finding convener of the form of education democracy. In recognition of Diane's work on these issues, she was recently named a Black Male Assessment Social Innovator by the Leadership and Sustainability Institute. Her efforts to protect voters of color span years of de dedication from filing one of the first ever lawsuits to in enforce the motor voter law to litigating on behalf of black Floridians after the 2000 election. Dinah has established herself as an expert in voting rights. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a wonderful lady, and I am woman, she is woman, Miss Diana Brown. Brown, Judith Diana Brown. I want to get her name right because I, she's a, a, a hyphenated woman. It's Miss Judith Brown <laughs> Diana. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for the introduction. It's wonderful to be here in North Carolina with you all this morning. Um, I want to thank the North Carolina State Conference of the NAACP um, for having me, but also Reverend Barber, who um, months ago told me that I was to appear. He did not ask, if you know him, he did not ask. He told me, Judith, I need you to do something. And when he says he needs you to do something, that's what you do. Um, so I want to um, thank him for having me. So I'm happy to be here with women in NAACP. As a mother, wife, sister, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, and girlfriend, I appreciate the role and work of women. We do so much for others and often forget ourselves. We balance all kinds of pressure and stuff and know how to make a way out of no way. And in the midst of so much, we know, or at least try, to hold it together. We are mighty, 
We are powerful, we are amazing, we are phenomenal. As Maya Angelou reminded us in her poem, Phenomenal Woman, now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need of my care, because I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. So phenomenal women, we have a task at hand. We are in a time of crisis. As you may know today, there are thousands who are gathered in Ferguson, Missouri to commemorate the two month mark of the killing of Mike Brown. But across the country, this crisis is brewing. Racial profiling and excessive use of force by police not only killed Mike Brown, whose last words were, I don't have a gun, stop shooting, but also in Ohio, where John Crawford, where his last words were, it's not real. In New York, Eric Gardner, where his last words were, I can't breathe. Our lives are precarious. Those who are supposed to protect us are killing us. We are fearing for our lives and people are enraged and we understand that rage. And too many young people feel right now that there is no one out there who is there for them and fighting for them. But in Ferguson, it has awakened a movement of young people who have said enough. Across the country, we also are seeing the system of public education under attack. Public schools that black children attend have shrinking resources. State legislatures are slashing budgets that trickle down to the classroom and hurt children. Schools lack even the most basic resources and supplies. Children are being tested, punished, and pushed out. There is disinvestment in our schools by states and then by some state, the same states, then turn around and label the schools as failing. Then it's used as an excuse to close the schools, turn them over to private operators, charter schools, and others, where there is no accountability, and often children get in if they win a lottery, or they get kicked out very easily for the smallest of reasons. Here in North Carolina, you know this story too well. Public education is under attack. Your legisla legislature tried to raid the cookie jar by moving more than $10 million to fund vouchers for private schools. Taking public money to pay for private education drains our schools that are supposed to provide equal education for all. Taking public money to pay for private education in a state that ranks 48th in per pupil spending on education is just plain wrong. We need more money for our children, not less. Our children deserve high quality education, but the legislature here doesn't agree. They want education for some and not for all. Thank goodness a court stopped this highway robbery by your state legislature. Well, the other thing we need our, we need our work on, to work on, to continue to work on, is in many states there is a war on voting. It's not a war that affects everyone, it's just certain people. The United States is seeing a shift and for some reason, to some people, it is scary. The browning of America is scary for some. It's estimated that by 2040, people of color will be a majority in this country. Approximately 30, every 30 seconds, an American Latino turns 18. There are three times as many Asian Americans in the US today as there were 20 years ago and there is a growing black, Caribbean, and African population. So America, as we have known it for at least three to 400 years, is changing. And for some, that is scary. You could imagine that if you are the oppressor, you should fear the oppressed. Because you should fear the oppressed because one day they shall be free. And then it's scary what they might do. This is all relevant to the ongoing war on voting. 
our country has always made it hard to vote. When we've experienced shifts in demographics, restrictions on voting, voting have always been used to silence certain populations like black folks, women, Latinos, Native Americans, to maintain the power of some. It was not until 1920 that Congress actually ratified the amendment to give women the vote. If you can manipulate access to the ballot, you can maintain power and make laws that benefit some and hurt others. The ballot is a powerful tool, and those who have been in power have always known it. In states like Florida and Ohio, known to be the deciding factors in presidential elections, the war on voting has been used year in and year out to slow and prevent change. Here in North Carolina, there you have it again, your legislature has been a trailblazer in turning back the clock. Nowhere else in our country have we seen such an incredible reversal of voting rights. Your legislature passed what is the kitchen sink, the mamma jamma, the monster of voter suppression. In 2008, North Carolina had one of the most progressive election laws in the country. I, in fact, I remember Advancement Project working here in 2008 and our lawyers saying, there's no problems to clear up. They've got a really good election law here. Stay in Ohio, stay in Florida, because North Carolina has a wonderful election law. And it wasn't made just out of the blue. It was because of years of work on the ground of the North Carolina NAACP and its partners that led to that election law. But in 2008, you all did something else. So you had the most progressive election laws through early voting and election day registration. Voters had incredible access to the voting booth. But there was a problem. The problem was that y'all went and voted. Some people were not happy about that. Because not only did you turn out, but you did the unimaginable. Almost one million African Americans turned out in 2008. 72% of registered black voters compared to 59% who voted in 2004. Black women, you turned out in 2008 and outnumbered black men three to two. I remember standing in Virginia on election day in 2008. And I was there to monitor the polls. And I remember I was with some union folks and they were on the phone with their friends um, in North Carolina, union folks in North Carolina. And they were trying to figure out whose state was coming in first and who was gonna bring it over the finish line. And I remember them calling and saying, we did it. And the people in Virginia saying, no, we did it. But we did the unimaginable. I can remember sitting on my couch when um, during one of the debates with two of my civil rights lawyer friends and my husband. And they were saying, you know what? Barack Obama's going to win. And I said, no, he's not. He is not going to win. I'm a, you know, I'm a civil rights lawyer too. And I know the underbelly of this country. I know how much hate people have. I know how it acts out. And he's not going to win, y'all. Are you crazy? They're like, no, he's going to win. Did you hear that speech? He is inspiring a nation. Y'all are crazy, you had too much to drink. <laughs> he's not gonna win. But people were inspired. And in North Carolina, you shook it up. You shook it up for a Southern state. Because Virginia, you know, some people say, oh, that Northern part's not South. Right? Alexandria, Arlington. So that Virginia doesn't really count anymore. But if you go down to Danville, you know it does count. But North Carolina, <laughs> North Carolina, who would have thought that in North Carolina that you would have brought him over the finish line? So when you do the unimaginable, there are people that say, it was the unimaginable. You all lost your minds. You have to remember, 
that this is not the way this was supposed to go down. But you turned around in 2012 and had the nerve to show them again. In 2012, 70.2% of black registered voters turned out and 76.4% of Democratic African American women turned out. These numbers were too high for some people, so they decided that they had to change the game. So I have this thing that I talk about with my daughter. She's 12 and she now hates to hear this story because she did this when she was younger. We're playing Uno, you know, the card game where you put down the colors and all that. And when you get to the last card, you have to say Uno. And so we'd be playing the game and I'd get down to two cards and she'd have like 10, right? Because I'm good, I'm real good. She'd have 10 and she'd say, there's a new rule. <laughs> I'm on the verge of winning this. On the verge. And she says, there's a new rule. Now, the new rule is that as you are putting the card down, you have this, the second card, there's two, right? So as you're putting this one down, you got to say, Uno, at, as soon as you start moving your hand, right? <laughs> and I'm saying, wait a second, but that's not what the rules in the on the instructions say, she says, my game, my cards, my rules is no different when it comes to voting, right? You did the unimaginable, wasn't supposed to happen, and then you had the nerve to do it two times because you didn't get the memo the first time, which said that you weren't supposed to do it the first time, and now you've done it the second time, but now we're gonna send you the memo. And what we're gonna do is, when you, that, la that card's going down, we're gonna change the rules. Because that's not the way this was supposed to go. And so now we have to do something different. That's the easy thing to do. The easy thing for them to do is to see the handwriting on the wall of the changing demographics <laughs> and say, no. We can hold on to this power a little longer, just a little longer, if we change the rules. But this is nothing new. It's nothing new. We have seen this game before. Every time there is a change in demographics, the rules change. Do you know that the idea around having a 30-day window before you, when you register before you can vote was about migration of people. First of all, it was about immigrants coming in and then wanting to not have them vote. It was about black folks migrating from south to north and people up north saying, where are they coming from? They're coming from Mississippi, they're coming from North Carolina, they're coming from South Carolina. We have to put in place a rule that makes them wait 30 days before they can vote. That was because they saw the handwriting on the wall. They're moving to Illinois. What, what, they're supposed to be in Mississippi, where they can't vote. Keep them down there. So instead, what they did was that they changed the rules of the game. And so here in North Carolina, it was time to change the rules of the game. So what did they do? All that stuff that was good, they said, we got to get rid of that because they're actually using it. They actually, used, they actually went to early voting. They actually registered during election day. We have to change the rules of the game. I mean, if my 12-year-old can do it, you could imagine that that legislature in North Carolina could do the same thing. And they had to wait, because they had to line up their cards, right? They had to get the whole legislature and control it and control the governor's mansion, right? had to do all of that because they know in the past they tried to push ID, but they couldn't get it through because the governor vetoed it. But now, because during a so-called off year, not a presidential election year, we didn't turn out in such record numbers so that they now had control. So they cut the first week of early voting. And in 2012, you all used that. In fact, Nearly 900,000 people cast ballots during that week that was cut. 
900,000 people cast ballots. Y'all turned out, but they said, we're getting rid of that. They ended same-day registration in 2012. You used that too. They said, we got to get rid of that. More than 94,000 people registered that way. They ended pre-registration of young people, eliminated out-of-precinct ballots because y'all moved too much and they don't want y'all voting out of precinct and having it count. God forbid you have a ballot that counts. And they made it easier to challenge voters. Why? Because that's a great tool of intimidation. So you all know what they did. But the fight was on. The North Carolina NAACP took to the streets, took to the Capitol, sat in jails with more than 900 people being arrested. Moral Mondays has swept through this state with a strong coalition pushing back on extremism, pushing back on tax cuts for the rich and the state's rejection of Medicaid expansion, supporting the freedom to marry, which just last night at 5.30 p.m. there were people being married in this state the freedom to marry has come to North Carolina. And fighting off attacks on public education and challenging voter suppression efforts, we took to the courts. Um, I'm co-director of Advancement Project, and we have two of our lawyers here, and I think Caitlin's here. Stand up. This is our legal team in North Carolina, part of it. And I want you to know, an all-woman team, by the way, women in the NAACP, that's right. Um, we had a victory in this case that was taken away temporarily by the Supreme Court. Now let's be clear, Governor McCrory had a choice. Let the people vote or silence them. He chose to silence voters by appealing the case to the Supreme Court. But fear not, that was temporary. It was a setback. We all know about setbacks because we know how to get over. And so it was, set, it was temporary because we will fight on. We will be taking the case to trial in 2015, and we will win. In the meanwhile, we cannot despair. We shall not be moved. We must be stronger than ever. We must show that try as you might, governor and legislature, we are a mighty people. We have overcome so much, and these efforts to go backward will not work. Governor McCrory and the legislature must not know their history. They must not know that we are resilient and that we fight back. They must not know that other Maya Angelou poem, Still I Rise. Too many lost their lives. Too many po paid poll taxes. Too many took phony literacy tests. Too many stood in long lines for us to give up. In our current fight, we have women leading the way. When I, you know, when we look at our lawsuit, the leading plaintiffs are all women. Like Ms. Rosanelle Eaton, and Armenta Eaton, and Carolyn Coleman, and Mary Perry, and Maria Un Unger Palmer, Jocelyn Ferguson Kelly, and Faith Jackson. All women, all leading the way as plaintiffs in the voting rights lawsuit. So many of you are leading the way by participating in Moral Mondays. We know, and you should know, that you are inspiring a nation. You are inspiring people across the country by your actions. You are showing people that while we learned in civics or social studies or whatever, in junior high school, elementary, whatever, that there are three branches of government, legislature, the court, and the executive, there's actually a fourth. The fourth branch of our government is we the people. Moral Mondays is spreading throughout the country as people are standing up to injustice and extremism. So, phenomenal women, and you men too, you are leading the way. But your work is not done. I know that each of you will vote. I know that. But we know that there is no Barack Obama on the ballot. And we know that in these so-called off years is when the dirt is done. This is not a presidential election, so we know that turnout may be done. But there is too much at stake. We can't let people sit home. So I want you to do something. Now, this is my favorite thing to do in church. So I need you to turn to your neighbor. I love this part of church. Now, you, now don't all turn the same way so all your heads are going that way. 
find a partner, turn to your neighbor and, and say to your neighbor, neighbor, dear neighbor, we have come too far by faith. We can't go backwards. We must keep moving forward. I know some people who aren't going to vote. But I am committing to you and to our cause to call 10 people and get them out to vote. Thank you. Women, women in NACP, keep leading, keep inspiring, keep moving us forward. Thank you.